Hi, everyone. For folks that just joined, I'm Murphy Man. I'm the Executive Director at Columbia Legal Services. I'm here with Dr. Ortiz for our virtual keynote event. I'm really excited to get started, and we'll give people a few more minutes to join. Before we dive in further, I want to introduce our wonderful interpreter, Fanny Cordero, who will be live interpreting in Spanish today. Fanny, would you like to say hello and let people know how to get audio in the language of their choosing? And it's also on the screen. Oh, hello, everyone. This is Fanny Cordero. I'm the Spanish interpreter. Eh, hoy día vamos a tener interpretación en simultáneo. Y para acceder al programa eh, en español, bajen en la parte de abajo de la pantalla, donde van a ver el icono de globo, y ahí pueden seleccionar el idioma español. Y por favor, eh, seleccionen el idioma preferido. Gracias. Thank you for joining us. Imagine Justice Week is our time to gather, celebrate, and reinvest in the long work for racial and economic justice in our state and everywhere. Among so many amazing legal aid organizations, and I see folks from around the country here today to join us, and I'm really excited to see you all and for the folks in Washington State as well. This is fantastic. We're pretty unique. CLS is pretty unique in that Unlike some of our legal aid counterparts, we don't take any government funding. Because if we took government funding, we couldn't do the work that we do today. There are certain groups of people that we could not work alongside. There are certain types of tools that we couldn't use. People have been pushed for this for, from justice, those who are incarcerated, subject to solitary confinement, people who do not have US immigration status, people here on H2A, visas have little protections from abuse and trafficking and people who are trying to exercise their right to organize or to collective power. We're so excited to have Dr. Ortiz with us today because his book and his work, the book An African American and Latinx History of the U.S., it paints a clear and convincing picture of what has led to and created the systems of oppression that our clients and communities face today. I love that it also highlights the history of astonishing resistance. It's both and. Ingenuity, solidarity, the many forces that seek to erase from our history books and collective knowledge, but that we want to continue to talk about and to have truth telling about. I'll say a little bit about Dr. Ortiz. Dr. Paul Ortiz is an American historian, author, professor of history at the University of Florida, and director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Originally from Bremerton, Washington, woohoo, shout out to Bremerton. Dr. Ortiz is a third generation military veteran, first generation college graduate, former organizer with the United Farm Workers, and author of many articles and books, including Emancipation Betrayed, A History of the Black Freedom Struggle in Florida, and Remembering Jim Crow, African Americans Tell About Life in the Jim Crow South, and an African-American and Latinx history of the United States. Dr. Ortiz, it is our honor and pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Can you start by sharing a bit about your background and personal history that leads you to your work today? Well, thank you, Mervyn. Just first of all, thank you so much for having me here today um, for the this incredible event. I'm just really a big admirer um, of the organization's work, you know, Columbia Legal Services is just a beacon uh, nationwide and even internationally uh, in the struggle for working class justice and equality for all. So I'm just really honored to be here. Um, you mentioned that I, I grew up in Bremerton and uh, Bremerton is, is the town I claim is my hometown. Um, um, I was actually born in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, my father was was active duty in, in the Navy, as many Bremerton families uh, are. And uh, so for the first 10 years of my life, I lived in Bremerton. Um, after my mother's first divorce, we moved to California and lived in the East Bay in California for about four years. Uh, and then after her second divorce, we moved back up to Bremerton. And so Growing up in the working class, you know, in a gritty shipyard town, very military environments, um, a lot of deindustrialization was going on. I graduated from high school in 1982. 
Um, we saw a lot of police uh, violence in our communities, a lot of corruption. You know, we understood, you know, uh, growing up, uh, I don't want to cast aspersions on my hometown, but growing up, the adults would say Bremerton was run by slumlords. Um, and actually, before I went in the military, I actually lived in an apartment that was owned by one of those powerful slumlords. And so um, this idea of the U.S. as kind of a, be a shining beacon on the hill, if you will, uh, didn't exist for us working class folk. Um, you know, we were called shipyard kids. That's what I was called in school. Um, I was fast tracked in the military. You know, college was not given to us as an, as an option. And so my friends know, even to this day, when people say things like, well, you know, college isn't for everyone. They're like, don't say that around Paul. He'll just get angry because that's what they told him when he was when he was in high school. And hey, you know, you could pick up a rifle and go fight for Uncle Sam. And then if you survive, you come back then maybe, maybe you can go to college, okay? And so it, it was a deep sense of injustice. Um, we grew up um, in a society, Murph, where working class people were just continuously being oppressed, harassed, didn't have rights, except if they had a union, if they had a collective bargaining contract, they had some sense of security um, and safety. Um, but otherwise, it was a very chaotic, you know, very corrupt kind of society. Um, when I went into the military, you know, then we went into the Reagan years and you mentioned uh, you, the history of Columbia Legal Services. Um, I was just looking through the papers of Legal Services Corporation in the 80s during the Reagan administration and saw how Ronald Reagan and the oligarchy in this country very instrumentally attacked and tried to, dis to dismember legal services um, because they didn't want working class and poor people to have any kind of legal representation. So they immediately defunded um, the, 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 a lot of legal services um, infrastructure during that time. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for that introduction. I think there's still a lot of the same things happening across our state and in Bremerton, and we continue that fight. And you talked about having a union and how important that is for working class people. And there's so much happening with unions today. We And we also, we collaborate with farm worker unions, including the UFW, with so much of our work around Washington. Can you talk more about your time as an organizer and perhaps the biggest lesson you took from that work? Murph, when I was in, so I, I was in U.S. Special Forces in Central America in the mid 80s. And that's when I got a big wake up call because I was working mainly on my own and I had more of a chance to talk to people in the region and realize that what my government was doing was imperialistic, it was crooked, it was killing people, it was driving people out of um, out of Central America. I mean, when I got back home uh, in the late 80s, I was shocked because a lot of my friends on the West Coast were saying, you know, Paul, you were just down in Central America. Why are all these Hondurans and Salvadorans and, and others you know, in Sacramento, in, in Tacoma, in, in, in Bellevue, et cetera, et cetera. I said, man, <laughs> it's our government, man. You know, uh, we're, we're forcing people out of their home villages. We're supporting these murderous contras in, in Central America. And we're making it impossible for people to raise their families. They're literally villages are being burned out and destroyed. Uh, and so, I don't understand what's so surprising about why so many people, it's it, it, what, what my colleague Juan Gonzalez refers to as the harvest of empire, okay? And so when I got back to the US, I determined that I wanted to, to learn how in the heck, you know, what, where, where, where had things gone wrong for this country? Why was the US not what it says we are, right? You know, we say we're a democracy. Why are we not a democracy? We say we're not an empire, but we are an empire. So how do these bad things happen? So I decided to that I wanted to become a historian. So the United being being organized with the United Farm Workers was the best possible place in the world for me to be. It was just as important for me as being in a library or an archive or classroom because I got to see history up close. I got to be with people who were making history. And that time, um, uh, I met my wife Sheila Payne, who many people on this call know. Uh, we, we met organizing farm workers during the Chateau Saint-Michel wine boycott. That was an eight year struggle. And I got to learn up close how the society is organized in such a way to prevent working class people, especially people of color, but white workers as well, to keep them 
disenfranchised, to keep them disempowered, uh, to keep them poor so that a small group of people can be rich, growers, agribusiness, petrochemical companies, fertilizer corporations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then a strata, middle-class strata people to manage the system, right? But most of the people that work in agriculture, my question, my, my first big history question, Murph, was the U.S. has the most profitable agriculture in the world. Why are most of the people working in agriculture poor? I mean, really poor, so poor, they had to qualify for welfare benefits. And I remember with Sheila uh, going to the state legislature in Olympia, and we were arguing um, on behalf of the United Farm Workers for a collective bargaining bill for farm workers in, in, in Washington state, and how disgusting it was because on the one hand, you had these noble, incredibly courageous farm workers getting up and saying, this is why I want collective bargaining. I don't want to have to beg. I don't want to have to apply for food stamps. That's what was you know, they had back then. Um, I want to be able to provide for my family. I want to have dignity on the job. And Murph City behind us were some powerful growers. And this is in the state legislature, in the state assembly. And they were laughing and joking and elbowing each other and saying, oh, man, uh, they don't need unions. That's what we have welfare for. Uh, and they even said it during the testimony. They said, this is why we have food stamps and welfare for these people. Um, and again, it was eye-opening, Murph. Um, to hear people in power say those things, but equally eye-opening to talk to agricultural workers and learn from them, because I'm proud to say that that campaign succeeded. And in the end, the workers want a union contract that is still, as you know, is still in force, you know, over uh, three, nearly three decades later. But the reason that the workers won was we used an organizing strategy which I believe is very similar to the strategy you have, where it's, it's the workers' voices first. And we we were very careful, Sheila Payne and I in the Olympia Farm Worker Justice Committee, we had a boycott committee and Murph, everywhere we went, we boycotted the wines. So it was such mm -hmm. an amazing social movement and workers all over the world started boycotting the wines. And when we started the boycott to support the workers' right to, to have a union election, it was really instructive because the first year, everyone laughed at us, right? The first two or three years, people laughed. They said, because Chateau Summit Shell Wines were owned by U.S. Tobacco, one of the most powerful or corporations in the world. And they say, you'll never be U.S. Tobacco, man. You are crazy. The next year, we went to the state legislature and we ran into the um, um, the, the spokesperson Shadow Saint Michel. Remember, they had the wonderful winery in Woodenville, Tony Bennett and Willie Nelson, and all these people would come and sing. Well, the the labor, like the writers strike now, the really cool people like Willie Nelson, he refused to cross the picket line, right? A lot of really good performers started honoring the boycott. And the Olympia Farmer Justice Committee, we had dozens of restaurants and stores drop the wines. And so the first year we ran into the Chateau Saint-Michel corporate guy, he laughed at us. The second year, he saw Sheila and I walking down the hallway of the state capitol, and he shrunk. I'll never forget this, Murphy. He kind of shrunk back and he said, hey, leave me alone. I, I, I tell all the stores to just honor the boycott. Uh, those people are fanatics. They won't leave you alone. Just drop the wines. And man, it was so inspiring because wow. um, I, for the first time in my life, Murph, I was learning the power of organizing, the power of people moving and working together, people from all races, backgrounds, genders, uh, classes even. Um, and I have a lot of prejudice right. against middle, upper middle class people, but even some of those people threw down with us. And we're saying, you know, our church, our synagogue, our mosque, our uh, 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 organizations like the NAACP stepped up uh, and, and really came to the fore to support the boycott. And so, in the midst of that, and I know I'm kind of giving you a long rambling question, um, and I'm going to have to, I, I know I have, to, I'm getting excited, so I need to slow down <laughs> a little bit for our, our great interpreter. Um, but in the middle of it, I was asked to give a lot of lectures about the history of the farm mm -hmm. movement, about the great boycott in the 60s. I wasn't around for that. Uh, and then this question, Murph, why are we so poor? If we're creating so much wealth, where is that wealth going? And so I was asked to do these workshops because people knew I went to college, right? And so to me, that was the most important job I had as a historian was to get it right um, and to talk about the UFW warts and all, 
because we're a union and we're a human institution, we make mistakes. Uh, Cesar Chavez um, was an icon and a hero and it still is a hero to me, but he was not perfect. Um, and so we wanted to talk about the movement, you know, warts and all what we would, what we were doing right, where the movement could be improved. And so that's really what really led me to where I am today, um, you know, as a freedom movement historian. What you said, Dr. Ortiz, really struck me about, I want dignity, I don't want to beg, and then how to make the dignity a reality. People from all different places, some who have power and some who didn't, all different communities had to come together, and that it was not overnight. It took years. So I'm really curious about these intersections and in the fight for liberation and how different communities have intersected over time. Can you talk about how that led you to write your book, An African-American and Latinx History of the United States, and why you felt it needed to be written? Murph, I, I wrote the book, you know, I think I gave the, the personal reasons, but as a teacher, as an organizer, continuing to work with my students, and, and I work with many first-gen students at the University of Florida, um, some of them are from Haiti, some of them are from the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, um, the Bronx, you know, all over uh, the Americas. And even when I taught at UC Santa Cruz, it was the same thing. I worked with a lot of first gen students from Mexico, from Central America, um, from the Inland Empire, you know, from Eastern Washington, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the thing they told me. Professor Ortiz. Why are my people, why is my family not in the history books? Are we that low? Are we that denigrated that we only show up when we assimilate to an Anglo standard? In other words, why are we missing? Um, why is not the Haitian Revolution talked about in the mainstream history books? Why is not the Mexican War of Independence talked about? And so... Each of those chapters, Merv, in African-American and Latinx history the United States, you're seeing essentially a recreation of a dialogue that I, I've had for years with students, with union organizers, uh, with people such as yourself, where we're sitting down and trying to figure out how do we change a fundamentally corrupt economic system, a system, Merv, that was not designed for you or me, or anyone in the Zoom call. And what I tried to do was to, to start, and what was the most interesting, people ask me, what was the most interesting part of the research, Paul? Um, and I love the movement stuff. You If you read the book, you know I'm a movement person. I, I love people in motion, the struggle, building power from the base. But to be honest with you, going back, Murph, and reading The Founding Fathers, was very instructive because I learned anew and in a much deeper sense that this society was not built for us. And that insofar as we had any rights or power, it was the, it was the stuff we built. Let me read you a brief excerpt from Federalist Number 2. Okay, everyone knows about the Federalist Papers, but it's interesting how very few people have read them. Well, I went back and read them when I wrote this book. Because I wanted to read what Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and those others had written about people like us. Dr. Ortiz, before you start, the interpreter is reminding me to remind you to please read slowly. Okay, so I'll, Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I will slow down. I, I wish I was reading because I'm talking kind of off the top of my head. I have to remember to, to but I will read this passage. So this is in Federalist Number 2. This is by the framers of the U.S. Constitution. And what they say is that Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. So that tells you right there, they're not interested in people who don't speak their language, right? People, right. they're not interested in people who are not from Europe. And so this gave me clues as to why we had to, our ancestors had to build 
these movements because they were not included in the original idea of even who, who would become a citizen. Yeah, and that's so powerful in your book. You quote Harriet Canty, Cesar Chavez, Jesse Jackson, and also uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, who talked about the connection between racial justice and labor that is so often left out now. Can you talk more about this connection and why you think it, there seems to be such a constant drive to erase it? Well, yes, Murph, and it does get back to that, that, that early history where the very idea of organizing a union was defined as a criminal conspiracy. When we were organizing with the United Farm Workers, we realized pretty quickly that the police hated us, you know, the courts hated us, the politicians hated us, and they wanted a society, and they still want a society where people like us, people that you work with, the people in power want a society, Murph, where we have to beg people in power to do the right thing. You know, please pay me a decent wage boss. Uh, please allow me to live in a neighborhood that has fire service. Um, you know, and, and, and in other words, keeping us in a situation of begging. And the people that you mentioned, Hattie Candy, uh, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Frederick Douglass, you know, the people, you know, Ida B. Wells Barnett, the people that I talk about are people who stopped begging and started demanding. But behind that, they put organization behind them. And the exciting thing, um, if I could just zoom in maybe even to one chapter of the book, chapter two, which really keys on the Mexican War of Independence. Well, there was a situation where the United States was saying, you know, spread slavery. Slavery is such a profitable, powerful system, making so much in profits, not just in the South, but in the North, in England and France and all these other um, nations. And it's Mexico where the poorest people of the society rise up in 1810 and say, basta ya, we're not putting up with the system anymore. We're not putting up with slavery, the oppression of indigenous people, and they rise up and create a successful revolution against slavery and against so many of the injustices um, that exist in the Americas at the time. And Merp, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who knows about that story in a US school. In fact, I'll never forget the first time I told that story about the Mexican War of Independence, you know, 1810 to 1821, it, 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 it culminates with the abolition of slavery and Mexico becoming a sanctuary for enslaved people, enslaved African-Americans from the U.S. to find freedom in Mexico. And I remember the first time Murph, I taught that lesson when I taught the introductory course at UC Santa Cruz. Um, students took a lot of notes. They looked at me kind of astonished. Um, several of them were from Mexico and had went to school primarily uh, in, in Mexico before they matriculated to, to college. A group of them came to my office hours after that lesson and were in tears. Um, they were humiliated. They were angry. And the reason they were angry, I'll never forget this, Murph, they said, we grew up in Mexico and we didn't even know our own liberation history. Why weren't we taught this basic history? We have Independence Day celebrations every year, but none of this is ever taught. And they wanted me to, to, to and I said, look, I'll tell you the same thing you're telling me. I didn't learn about this growing up. I didn't learn about the, the kind of radical uh, uh, aspects of the American Revolution. Uh, why should you have learned about the radical aspects of the Mexican Revolution? This, these countries don't want us, Murph, knowing how powerful we really can be. They don't want us. They want us in the mindset of competing against each other. They want you to see any gain I make in society as a loss to you. Uh, it's what I call the zero-sum vision of citizenship. That's the kind of society I was raised in. And as, a, as, as organizers, 
uh, and as activists with legal services uh, institutions and unions, we reject that, that right. model, right? Right. This is an incredible conversation, Dr. Ortiz. Thank you so much, and it will continue. We're going to take a short five-minute break for our interpreter, who is working incredibly hard, doing uh, work that's very taxing. Uh, I want to thank Fanny again. Big round of applause for Fanny. And I have exciting news during the break. If you would like to win a copy of Dr. Ortiz's book, An African American and Latinx History of the United States, you have a chance to do so. So get your email fingers going. You need to email communications at columbialegal.org. That's communications, all one word, communications at columbialegal.org. I need to answer this question. What does justice mean to you? We'll pick 10 people to receive a book. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in five minutes. And again, that's communications at columbialegal.org. All right, I hope everyone had a few minutes and Fanny is well rested and we'll get back to our conversation. Hopefully everyone was able to uh, put their name in the hat to receive one of your books, Dr. Ortiz. All right. The next question is kind of a long one, so I hope that everyone can bear with me. At CLS, we use the law, legal tools, legislative tools, advocacy tools, class actions to try to correct injustices that are actually baked into our laws. So these injustices have actually been the whole point of our laws to uphold this white supremacy. You talk about all of these laws in your book, including the creation of the Electoral College, which in your book, you talked how it was designed to protect enslavers' interests in the legislature. And the Naturalization Act, which was to enshrine whiteness and our very constitution, which was to uphold enslavement and property rights. You wrote about the lasting effect of these laws. And here's a quote from your book, quote, the racialization and denial of citizenship to entire classes of workers became the blunt instrument that employers used to keep wages low in numerous occupations identified with undesirable African-Americans and later immigrant labor. I keep coming back to this passage because of our work at CLS. It's, root, it's rooted to this truth even 250 years later. We, we advocated for fair wages and overtime pay for farm workers in Washington who are 99% Latinx, many on H-2A visas from Mexico, for workers in prisons who only earn not more than 42 cents an hour here in Washington, and they cannot collectively bargain. They're prohibited from doing that. In these prisons, black and brown people are hugely, as we know, overrepresented. Over and our constitution still allows forced labor for punishment of a crime. Dr. Ortiz, how do you see the law upholding oppression in place today? And what role do you think lawyers and legal advocates have in today's movement of resistance? Well, I think Columbia Legal Services is doing that kind of work that serves as a model, Murph, for um, your, your question. I really appreciate the question because it sounds to me like you're really searching for um, both thinking about what are the origins, where, where do these problems come from? What can we do with them? But also, how do we explain defeat? Now, as a mm. movement organizer, that's a very important thing. That's what I learned, you know, working, um, you know, with Sheila Payne, working with the United Farm Workers of Washington State, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee in North Carolina, but even my own union, um, I'm wearing a union-made shirt, right? For the United Farm uh, United Faculty of Florida, uh, we're an AFL CIO union as well, and the the easiest thing in some ways, um, well, recruitment is never quite easy, but in some ways, if you have a good cause, a good justice cause, 
then at the front end, maybe it is a little easier to get people together, but that's an important part of being a movement organizer. But what about when you lose? You know, what about when you lose a case, when you lose a union vote, uh, when you lose a struggle over legislation? Um, that's where it's most important as fellow travelers. I mean, that's where the values of solidarity are so important. Solidarity for us is not just a word. It's a way of life. I have your back. You have my back. We're in the movement together and we struggle together. And when you're down, I'm there to try to pick you up and vice versa. Now I sound like a self-help tape, right? But it's really true. Those values of solidarity are the things that are going to, to get us through when we lose and we will lose. I've lost most of the battles that I fought in. Um, Sheila and I referred to the San Michelle boycott or the or the, the Mad Olive Pickle boycott in North Carolina. Um, but these are rare victories in a sea of, of losses. But it was the losses that allowed us to learn how to, to win sometimes. I'll, I'll give you one more example. I was a picket captain during the 1990 Greyhound bus strike, a picket captain at the Olympia bus terminal, and we just got crushed. And I mean, we lost. And it was so, I mean, even now it's depressing to think about that strike because we almost knew, and the drivers had to stop picketing early on because they had to take charter routes, you know, with other bus um, companies to make ends meet. And so I was left back at this, this station, but I learned so much in that defeat. And what I learned was the importance of resilience and that we're going to have to go backwards sometimes. And this is the reason that I wrote African-American and Latinx history of the U.S. the way I wrote it. Think about being a Mexican in what's now Arizona or New Mexico or Southern California in the 1830s. And think about what you lose when the U.S. invades your nation and you go from having a certain kind of citizenship to being literally a stateless person. Uh, you go from maybe owning a small parcel of land in the 1840s to having the Texas Rangers steal it from you a decade or two later. Um, think about what it meant to be a black person and to fight for freedom in the Civil War. And then that first time you, you show up to vote and the 90 percent voter turnout rates, Murph, in the county I live in right now in Alachua County in, 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 the, in the first Reconstruction election where black people can vote. But then 10 years later, Ku Klux Klan terrorism and corrupt laws drive black people away from voting. Ku Klux Klan terrorism uh, and the Texas Rangers drive Mexican people away from from owning land. And so we go from having an, the, we go from where there was an image of the Mexican peasant or small farmer. And now the image of the Mexican traveling worker is of a landless worker. How did that happen? Right. And so uh, I guess this is a rambling response to your very long and very sophisticated question. Part of it, Murph, is I, I also grew up in a backlash time. In the 1970s, as a young boy growing up, we heard all the time that the Blacks and the Mexicans had too many rights and that the white people had lost all these rights, right? And part of it, I think, is we have to teach each other that your gain is not my loss. And the other thing I see as a real model, in addition to the work that Columbia Legal Services does, my the oral history program, we do a lot of work with the Equal Justice Initiative um, in Montgomery, Alabama. And the work they've done with death row um, inmates is really spectacular as, as the work you do here uh, in, in Seattle and in the Northwest. And let me give you one example of how history plays into this. We interviewed, my students interviewed some of the staff attorneys who had worked on the, the big death penalty case that a young Brian Stevenson um, argued. And it's in the movie Just Mercy. And the character, I think, of the death row inmate was played by a famous actor. Um, I'm blanking out who that was. But during the course of the movie, we see a young Brian Stevenson, just graduated from Harvard Law School, who comes back to the judge. He's so excited because he's found so much evidence which he believes will exonerate 
his unjustly accused client, including testimony from the client's boss who says, look, this man could not have committed this, this capital offense because he was locked in his workplace because I was I locked my employees in the warehouse to make sure they didn't steal from me. And so he couldn't have committed this murder, right? And so Brian Stevenson brings this, this um, evidence to the judge and the judge is like, so what? He's still guilty. That was a wake-up call for Brian Stevenson. And the wake-up call was what the staff attorneys told my students who interviewed those attorneys in Montgomery, Alabama, which is that you can have all the evidence and the facts of the case on your side if you want, but if the judge and jury look at your clients and they see black and brown people, they see guilty. They see a dysfunctional history. They see a lesser than. They see outsiders. And this is why our work as organizers and movement historians is bringing people in. That's why when we use terms like inclusivity or welcoming, those are not just propaganda terms. Those are not just rhetoric. Those are life or death types of concepts. Unless we can get people to see the people that we work with and ourselves as human beings, we're just going to lose every time. And that's why we have this corrupt system, which would would collapse like a house of cards. Imagine what would happen if those 16 to 20 million people who are undocumented stopped working. Um, this whole society would crumble. Yes, it would. And how do we how do we access and help people get in that struggle and and face the backlash? You talked a lot about the backlash that happens even when we win. And also, how do we lose well? How do we build those relationships so we can keep fighting even when it seems impossible, even when we lose? And how can we build on those wins? And I'm curious because there has been huge backlash and Florida has been one of the leaders in the backlash on truth telling and knowing our history. You're a professor of history in the state of Florida. You've written a history book called An African-American and Latinx History of the United States. Can you talk about that? What is it like to be a professor doing this kind of work in Florida? And how do you see the current fight against truth in the context of our nation's history? And maybe if you have time, what can we all do about it? Murph, it's exhilarating and exhausting and heartbreaking all at the same time. And the reason I say that is that there are so many courageous people in Florida, in, in churches, in synagogues and mosques today who are teaching black studies or gender studies, or even about the Holocaust, because in our public schools, these courses are being driven out by fear by a tyrannical state, uh, we're going full fascist here in Florida. We're, we're in a state of crisis, and it isn't just in Florida. Um, we have a governor who wants to uh, win the GOP nomination, and he's figured the way to do that is to scapegoat people. He's passed draconian anti-immigrant bills. He's tried to censor and ban Black studies. My job as a movement scholar is to remind all of us that these things connect to each other. So you steal our history away from us. You teach us that people like Murph and Paul are lesser than, that we are not really full citizens, that we're outsiders, that we don't deserve full equality and emancipation. Um, and then number two, you rob us of our rights as workers. And so those two things go together. First, you teach us that we're inferior and you teach the people in our universities and our high schools that this group of people, L LGBT people should have less rights. They're not male and female. Black people or Latinos should have less rights. They're not European, right? There, there's a reason why there's a fetish now among reactionary oligarchs to work, to bring back this worship of what they call Western civilization, because they see it as an Anglo white civilization. And you and I are not invited. Um, 
the irony, Murph, is if you go to Europe and you start talking about Western civilization, they'll just laugh at you. They're like, what are you talking about? But in Florida, it's terrifying because we have people being oppressed every single day. Parents who who are terrified, they can't even go to their schools because they lack a legal identification. They can't go. They, they feel like they can't even go shopping because the border, they're afraid that their neighbors will call the border patrol on them. And in the universities and in the high schools, we're being enlisted in this draconian battle to say that, well, that's just the way things are. Um, that's the way things have always been, right? And so that's what we're fighting against right now, even as we speak. So tomorrow night, we have the national, we have the African-American um, studies, the national organization having their conference in Jacksonville. It was an organization that was founded by Carter G. Woodson 106 years ago. And as part of that, we're doing a series of community events. One of them is a banned book event where um, uh, I will be reading, Angela Davis will be reading a passage of Toni Morrison's Beloved, uh, that's one of the most heavily banned books in the South in Florida now. Um, I'll be reading a passage of Kurt Vonnegut's um, Slaughterhouse Five, a brilliant anti-war uh, novel. And that's that. This is these are some of the ways, Murph, that we're fighting back. Another inspiring thing was the Dream Defenders um, is one of our black our main Black Lives Matter movement uh, organization in Florida, called a statewide walkout last February, you're, many of the viewers here remember in Florida, when the governor of Florida banned advanced placement black studies, in response, a dream defender said, well, let's just, let, let's walk out and protest. Let's do something meaningful. So we did the walkout, but um, at the University of Florida and some, and some other schools, institutions across the state, we went for one step further. We did teach-ins. We need to prove, Murph, that all of these topics that are being censored or banned are important and that our students and our, our community members want to learn these things. Look, if no one wanted to learn LGBT studies or Black studies, that's one thing. But the reality is, is that so many people are hungry to learn about, they want to learn about Mexico. You know, they want to learn about non-gender binary cultures that have always existed, you know, going back millennia. Uh, they want to learn indigenous histories. Um, and states like Florida are saying, well, no, they only want to learn about Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> well, God love Alexander Hamilton. That's great. Teach about him. He's you know, a very important figure, right? But the fact is my students want to learn about Latino history. They want to learn Black studies. They want to learn LGBT studies. They want to learn gender studies and, and these other fields. And the best way to keep us pacified, and Murph, this is the last thing I'll say, the reason that states like Florida are trying to ban a topic like Black Studies has to do with those names you mentioned earlier. You mentioned Hattie Canny. We talked about Frederick Douglass. The reality is that Black and Latinx histories give us these incredible role models and examples of how we change the society, how we make it more just, how we build equality. Um, as a union president, that's what I'm into. Look, I know collective bargaining is not revolutionizing the world, but it gives us a modicum of dignity. And that's why the state is even trying to take that away from us right now. That was really powerful. I made me curious to think whether or not your book has been banned. And it has, yes. In some, it, in some, in some school districts, it has been, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it makes me think about the legal services corporation laws and regulations that came out in the 90s that still impact us today that silenced lawyers. So some lawyers, if they took the money, then they could not speak in the legislature. They could not file a class action lawsuit. They could not speak to people and organize them around their rights and how that's an extension of the racism written into our laws because it wasn't just anyone that was left out. It was people who are in prison. It was people trying to organize. It was workers who are undocumented. And for me, that's racism. And so that's why CLS focuses on adv advocating alongside people who are undocumented, people who are incarcerated, people who are asserting their collective power, because those groups are specifically carved out by our government. 
these funding restrictions forces CLS to rely entirely on private foundations. So here's, here's our pitch for everyone. We believe that everyone deserves justice. And we know the community of Washington and the national community believes that as well. So we're grateful that if you're able to make a donation of significance, whatever that means to you, we would, again, appreciate that so much to do this work, to stand up and stand with people who are impacted and oppressed, and yet incredibly resilient, creative, and fighting so hard. So there's a link in the chat where you can help us reach our Imagine Justice goal. And everyone who makes a gift today of any size, this is very exciting, will receive the wonderful, beautiful, amazing 2024 Imagine Justice Youth Art Calendar. I looked through that and I was incredibly moved by it. It features the winning entries of our youth art contest and they're so inspiring. And I think you'll really enjoy the calendar. So thanks again. We're, we're going to open it up now for any questions you may have for Dr. Ortiz. You can either, I think, put them in the chat or raise your hand. And we so appreciate you all being here. And we'll stay a bit longer as needed for uh, questions. So please put your questions in the chat or raise your hand. I don't see any questions yet. Thoughts, comments? There's over 80 people. I know it got me to thinking to listen to you, Dr. Ortiz, and I'm sure others must have some thoughts or questions. And perhaps uh, chat folks, I'm just not seeing it. So if you could text me, that would be great. Okay, here is a question. How do you keep showing up bravely when it gets so tough? Well, um, you know, it helps to have a movement comrade that I'm married to, Sheila Payne. And we, just to tell you a, a story of when Sheila and I met um, organizing farm workers in the late 80s, early 90s. And, you know, we ended up getting arrested and going to jail together. And Sheila and I were actually in, in jail in Olympia. Uh, things were not looking good for us. And um, this, and you mentioned earlier about, you know, what can attorneys do and never underestimate the importance of, of a social justice lawyer, Murph, because Sheila and I were in, in a prison cell. Um, the guards were getting aggressive. Um, they hated what we were doing. They hated farm workers. They hated unions. And out of nowhere, in walks in an older white gentleman wearing a pinstripe suit. Now, in my entire life growing up in the working class, I'd never seen a person wearing a pinstripe suit. I'd read about pinstripe suits. And in comes this older white man, and he looks, he goes to the sergeant, the guard. He says, Sergeant, I suggest you let these good folks out on their own recognizance, or you're in for a world of trouble. And I was like, who is this guy? And, and he was an attorney and his name was John Thorne. And John had worked with Cesar Chavez. He had worked with George Jackson. He had worked with Angela Davis and the Black Panthers. But we didn't know that at that time. We were just so blessed to have this incredible attorney come in, go to bat for us, got Sheila and I out of prison. And Sheila and I figured, you know, if we went to jail together, we could get married, you know? And so we got married. We've been married now for 27 years, 28 years. Um, and, and that's really what keeps me going is having a, a, a comrade, um, mm -hmm. that we can share our, 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 our rare victories with, but also I mentioned earlier, talk about, you know, when things are not going well and, and having a community, um, like Columbia legal services, like our union to me at the university of Florida, um, our administration is, is clueless in terms of defending the rights of students and workers but our union comrades are the people that kind of keep me, keep me motivated. Thank you, Dr. Archies. There are many and numerous notes in the Q&A of appreciation and thanks for all that you've said. 
Uh, we have uh, three questions and I also noticed a hand is raised. Kia, did you have a question? Mr. Hamilton has a question. Mr. Hamilton is one of our board members who is has a question. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton, for attending. Oh, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for the great speech. I, I, I would just like to know uh, if you have any suggestions on how we can here at WCC uh, start a program for African American studies. Mr. Hamilton is currently incarcerated, Dr. Ortiz. Yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my email in the chat because this is a great question. I'd love to talk, you know, and respond to. I mentioned ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, this is part of what our association does nationally is we help local communities and organizations kind of get things going. Um, we we'll, we'll love to talk. Sorry, he has to hang up because he has to call back every 20 minutes. So the, the line's going to cut off on him. So he'll call back. Sorry. And I will call I right know. back. Yeah. The caller has hung up. We'll wait a moment until uh, Mr. Hamilton can call back in. And Dr. Ortiz, in the meantime, there's a question in the chat. Besides money, what can I do? Being there is really important. And, you know, we talked about as organizers, you know, what can people who, who are concerned but maybe don't have a lot of resources, you know, most of us when we start in the movement don't have resources. And, but just, you know, being there with people in struggle um, is a big deal. Letting people know you are not alone. You know, I may not be, and, and even, you know, I'll, I'll give a pitch here for intersectionality. And, you know, I have tried to be a fellow traveler with many of my students who are say, you know, non-binary um, in terms of, of, of gender. Now, I, I can't experience that. I don't know what that really means because I am a, a part of the binary gender system. But being there with my students, just showing up, for example, we had um, that my students had had a march, LG, my LGBT students last year, and they asked me if I would come and just be there with them. And I went there with them. I didn't say anything, but they said afterwards, just you being there was really important. So that's one thing that we can do. Um, and especially now, People, there's such a sense of isolation, Murph. We feel it in Florida. I know you feel it sometimes too uh, in Seattle, but but just going to a demonstration, going to a read-in, going to be part of a community and saying, you know, I'm just here to support um, and, and not even having to open your mouth um, mm -hmm. is, is can be a liberating thing. Thank you, and I don't... Kia, is uh, Mr. Hamilton back? Yes, yeah. he's back. Yeah. Great. Welcome back, Mr. Hamilton. Well, thank you. Do you have anything to add about how to access African American studies while someone is in prison? Yes. So there's a lot of really good, nope. like critical, nope. critical resistance. Oh, you for me or for Mr. Hamilton? For Mr. Hamilton, and just okay. generally, yes, right. great. You say it for me, Dr. Ortiz? Do you? Sorry for okay. the confusion. Do you have anything to add for Mr. Hamilton about how he can access and help others to access African American studies while they are in prison? Yes, you know, there's organizations, a program. Yeah. You're you're looking for a specific, you know, specific programs, right? How, how can we start? How can we uh, uh, try to initiate starting a program here at WCC up for uh, African American studies? We want to create, create a curriculum. Okay, I see. What I've done is I put my so it's a it's a complex question, but there's a lot of good models there. 
And I'd love to have a conversation right. about that. Um, right. because some really good resources there that we can share with you. And maybe even depending where you're at, there might be a local chapter of Asala, you know, and, and they may be able to help get things going as well. Well, but I put my email, let me put my email in the chat again, um, because this is going to be a paramount issue in our African-American history conference this week in Jacksonville. I'm getting ready to head up there tomorrow is how do we spread the word? How do we get, because if states are banning these histories in public schools, um, how do we help churches? How do we help unions? How do we help community organizations develop and teach this curricula outside of the places that it's being banned? There is also a note from your wife in the, in the chat uh, that I will read. Let's see. Sheila Payne, Paul did not talk about how many times he has been interviewed by the press. And his first comment is always that I am not going to change a thing I teach my students. Why should they not learn history? Why should the best literature that is available, they should read the best literature that is available. To not do so is to put them at a disadvantage in regard to what their peers are learning. Yeah, I mean, Sheila hears, yeah, Sheila hears these conversations and Murph, we're asked every day in Florida, um, you know, Toni Morrison is is too tough. Uh, James Baldwin is too tough. You know, Alice Walker, you know, let, let's wait a few years and then we can kind of bring them back. To me, that that's a scam. That's corruption. And because I know what my colleagues, what teachers assign up in Massachusetts or out in California they're reading Toni Morrison, you know, they're, they're reading Isabel Allende, uh, they're reading um, Rudy Acuna. Uh, why should they not read them in the state of Florida? And I, I, I hate to say this, but the people who are the head of our universities and colleges who should be speaking out here are not doing it. Um, the last meeting I had with, with one of the deans here on campus, he said, Paul, you know, maybe going forward, you could talk less about race. Uh, would you, you know, do you think that's a possibility? And I'm looking at the guy, I'm saying, it's my students that want to learn about race. Mm -hmm. I'm not making this stuff up. And mm -hmm. there, there's so much cowardice right now. I've learned, look, I've taught about Nazism in Germany for many years. I've, I've studied fascism and how it developed in Spain, in Italy in the 1920s and 30s. But unfortunately, Murph, I've now we're getting firsthand lessons about how it develops. Um, you know, we lived in restrictive societies here in Florida for many years already. We're the most highly incarcerated state uh, and the most highly incarcerated nation on the planet. Uh, and, and yet things are actually getting worse. Uh, so that, that's why it's important for us to have events like this right now. We can kind of get together uh, and give each other strength and courage. And there is a great question in the chat. I'm going to ask two, one last question. But before I ask that, and organizers may want to respond, and this may be putting your email in the chat is, how do you unionize in your place of employment? So if there's someone on the call that wants to unionize where they work. So what would be some steps that folks could take? Well, I'll, you know, I'll just throw in, but again, it's, I know there's a lot of organizers in the chat, but one of the things is, is to uh, find allies um, and to begin to act like union members towards each other, having each other's backs, looking out for each other. Um, and that's really step one. Um, there's really good uh, workshops and tools on kind of the step, the step-by-step -step process of becoming a union and there are different models let's be frank about this you know there i work with with organizers who are in the iww and uh, uh industrial workers of the world and they have a specific model of organizing you know others are in afl cio unions um i always suggest folks go to labor notes it's a really good online publication and labor notes has a lot of good tools on how to kind of get started but for me, the most important thing, what Sheila and I learned many years ago is, is the first thing is stand up for each other. Don't allow a fellow worker to be abused on the job. 
And when you do that, when you model that kind of behavior, then people are like, wow, there's a way other than just me competing for the rest of my life to death. You know, there, there's a way of solidarity. There's a way of cooperation. You know, again, living out those those values is really, the to me, the most important step in becoming a union person. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. I think you pretty much answered this question, which is, how do we find and foster a community for organizing and education and action? You have to have, you have to have meetings, you have to get together. Um, I'm not sure if I, there was a book that came out years ago called Democracy is an Endless Meeting. Um, <laughs> I, I hate to believe that's true, but I have a suspicion about it. Um, I think getting together, I think Murph, this is where the pandemic um, had negative impacts because, um, you know, number one, our first thought was to try to keep each other safe, right? Our families, our friends and loved ones. Um, and it was the right thing to do. But it really, in many ways, hampered a lot of organizations that I have worked with um, that weren't, that didn't have the privileges. Like my union, we're a union of middle class professors. We went from being in person, having in person union meetings, which are so mm -hmm. very important, to having Zoom meetings, okay? But that, that reflects the kind of privilege that we have as professors. We have the resources to do that. Well, not everyone has the resources to do that. And so we have to find ways to keep coming together one-on-one. -on -one. And now that we have ways to stay safer, even though we're still in a pandemic, um, get back to those basic door-to-door, one-on-one let's get together types of meetings. Uh, let's be safe, right? Let, we can do the social distancing thing, but we can still get together and we can still knock on doors because mm -hmm. that's how we win. We have the people. They have the money, but we have the people. And believe me, if you don't think that we have the people, this is why these terrible laws, Murph, as you know, in your line of work are being passed because the people in power know that younger people want to change. They know that the majority of people in this country want amnesty. They know the majority of the people in the United States don't want endless war. They know that the majority of the people in the United States want equality, right? And so that's what they're afraid of. Uh, but mm -hmm. right now we're a little too fragmented, but we, but we, you keep doing the work you're doing, the work, the people that are on this chat, we keep doing the work that we're doing we come together, we're going to win in the long run, I think. that That's going to be my, people may think, oh, Paul, now he's just kind of being naive. But um, I'm very hopeful because I can tell you that our ancestors who fought, were fighting for freedom in Mexico or in uh, Africa or in Europe centuries ago, if we ever gave up, <laughs> they, I'm afraid, I mean, part of what, Part of what animates me, Murph, is knowing that I come from ancestors who fought like hell to become free, to, to make a better life for, the, for their people and their families. And so I just can't give up because of that, that long history. We talk, You talked earlier about Hattie Canny and a person who I think about quite often who came from really nothing, from, from rural Alabama and ended up leading a union of 50,000 women in Las Vegas and shook things up. I mean, it was so incredible what the culinary workers did uh, in the 80s and the 90s and changed the whole face of the labor movement. So it was, it was really exciting. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. We unfortunately have to end the conversation. I wanna thank you so much and thank everybody uh, for being on this chat, being part of this conversation. Remember, if you donate, you get a calendar. So if you want a calendar, please give a, a donation. And it really struck me what you said, that they have the money, we have the people, and that we're not giving up. And that is so powerful that we're all in this together. So I just want to thank you again. This has been very moving for me, a great conversation to be inspired, to keep up, keep up the work, keep up the fight, and that we have to do it together. We have to have 
solidarity, whether it's one organizer talking to one person behind a door or one coworker talking to another coworker and standing up for them. Whether it's local, state or national, we're all in this together. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Everyone. Yeah, please call, call me anytime. And I look forward to getting up next time up in Seattle. I would love to look you all up. That would be awesome.